All right, hi everybody. Welcome to our webinar today on Thousand Cankers Disease and Laurel Wilt. I'm Rachel McCarthy and I'm the Training and Outreach Coordinator for the First Detector Program. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. We're recording the webinar today and we will post the link um, as soon as we're able to. And that link can be found on the uh, First Detector training site, the same place where you signed up for this webinar today. Um, let's see. If you have a question um, during the presentation, uh, we're using a question and answer box. Um, please use that. Um, you can put them in as you think of them and um, we'll probably hold questions until the end of the program. If you have any issues with your uh, sound or your video, please use the chat box and uh, anything else. Um, if you raise your hand, we're unable to really um, reach out to you or contact you directly. Uh, so if you have any issues or a question, um, please use either the chat or the question and answer box. So let's get started. Um, joining us today for um, a talk on Thousand Cankers Disease and Laurel Wilt is Dr. Alan Windham from the University of Tennessee. And Alan, if you're ready, I'm going to turn the floor right over to you and Alan can give us a little bit of um, background on himself and then jump into today's topics. Two things that I'm not um, as well versed in. So excited for the program. Alan, are you ready? I'm ready, Rachel, can you hear me okay? Hear you great. Okay, great. So Thanks, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, well, first I'd like to thank Rachel for the invitation to do this webinar and um, uh, it's a great honor. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I, I grew up on a research uh, station, uh, one of Mississippi State University's research stations. My father was a horticulturist and he raised three sons and we all became plant pathologists. And my twin brother, Gary, retired from USDA Ag Research Service in November. And my older brother, Mark and I both worked for the University of Tennessee. And we have worked, it's, it's kind of strange to, to work with your brother, but uh, he's in research and teaching and ornamentals and other things, and I do 100% extension ornamentals. So he and I have worked together for 35 years. And for our whole career, we've been at the University of Tennessee, and it's been a lot of fun, and we've gotten, a lot, gotten to do a lot of neat things. Uh, I'm actually located in Nashville, and when this uh, COVID thing gets over, come visit us here in Nashville. It's a great city. So what have Mark and I been working on the past 35 years? <clears throat> Probably one of the biggest projects we started on was uh, on dogwood since it's such a big nursery crop here in Tennessee. And we had uh, research projects on dogwood anthracnose where we were part of the team that developed the Appalachian series of powdery mildew or dogwood anthracnose resistant flowering dogwoods. And after dogwood anthracnose, we worked on uh, dog, uh, powdery mildew on dogwood. And then along the way, we've worked some with thousand canker disease. And uh, right now, our big project right now is rose rosette disease. And we're part of the combating rose rosette team that's a multi-state, multi-university. Uh, also have folks from USDA on that. So that's a big project right now. So I will get started here. So I'm really, I've done a lot of training through my career for um, landscape professionals, turf professionals, master gardeners, just the general public. And I think there's really a great value in training first detectors. And I'll give you some examples. The first sample of impatience downy mildew from a landscape planting that we ever saw in the state was a master gardener brought this in from a landscape from our home in, in West Nashville and she knew about it because we had discussed it in the Master Gardener interning training. Uh, just last year we had a landscape manager uh, bring in leaf rust on American hornbeam and European hornbeam and this manager had been has been to our several of our workshops that we've done on uh, disease diagnosis and insect training. And if you go to the USDA host fungus index and look at, at hornbeam, uh, you don't even see a rust listed for the US. So I think this was probably the second 
uh, time that it was identified, the first was Jason Smith identified it uh, down in Florida. And we have sent our samples to the University of Florida to be identified. And as of right now, I don't know what that, the name to hang on this fungus. I have a good idea because rust is, I think, fairly common in Europe on European hornbeam, but has not been reported on American hornbeam. And then lastly, uh, dogwood anthracnose, uh, the first sample we ever had from the Nashville area was from the horticultures at Vanderbilt University, who's uh, always been part of our training sessions. Uh, he recognized it, alerted us, and uh, went out and took samples and confirmed it. So first detectors come in all types of, uh, there's professionals, regulatory, extension, all types, but uh, lay people are everywhere, so it's great to train them too. Now this, my presentation on thousand canker disease is not all comprehensive. It's a little bit of an overview and a little bit of a story of what thousand canker disease on black walnut has been like in the, in the eastern United States, and particularly in Tennessee. And I couldn't have done this presentation without the help of doctors Bill Klingerman and uh, Janita Ozibotic, who's uh, part of the UTI, UT team here working on thousand canker disease. So just a little update. Some of their work has been with partners from several universities and agencies. And a lot of it has been with the walnut twig beetle. So thousand canker disease is a complex of the fungus Geosmithia morbida and the walnut twig beetle, Pediophorus juglandus. And uh, for good reason, there's lots of concern about thousand canker disease just because of the value of standing black walnut, not to mention all the other walnut species that might be affected. If you look at some of the species and how they're distributed worldwide, TCD is certainly a global concern. And the nearly all juggling species are susceptible, plus some wingnut species and I think you can see here the Juglans major, the Arizona walnut is tolerant, but most all the other walnuts that are in the in North America are pretty susceptible. This may not be the most up-to-date map, but <clears throat> it shows a pretty good picture of where thousand canker disease, where it has been, where it was early in the 2000s and even the late 1990s and where it spread into the east. In the first location in front of the east, it was found in Knox County, Tennessee in July of 2010. And in this case, it was someone that stopped at a truck stop in, in West Knoxville. And they knew a little bit about, uh, well, that was Emerald Ash Borer. Emerald Ash Borer was also found July 2010. So Emerald Ash Borer was found at a truck stop in West Knoxville. Uh, by someone that knew a little bit about emerald ash borer. In the same month, a homeowner called the Division of Forestry Forester in Knoxville and said, hey, why are my, why are my walnuts uh, declining? And the forester went out, he knew a little bit about thousand caker disease, took a sample and had it confirmed USDA. So that was our first report in July of 2010, a thousand caker disease. So since that time, it's really the spread of it has really been slow compared to uh, there's Knox County in the in the middle. And over 10 years, it really it's, it has spread to 10 counties, but there's no outliers really, which is kind of unusual. It hasn't really spread outside the area where it was first found. So it's moved. The beetle and the fungus has moved really slow. So one thing that's that's obvious is that thousand canker disease in the east is quite different than it is in the west. Uh, now compare that to the emerald ash borer that just added two new counties in Tennessee this this month. Uh, found the same month, July 2010, as thousand canker disease. Emerald ash borer now is found in 63 counties in Tennessee, so it has really spread rapidly. You probably may have seen some of these photos of the fungus. Uh, the walnut twig beetle, the galleries that it causes, and the kind of the famous glamour shot that Joe Boggs with Ohio State took, uh, just showing the size and scale of walnut twig beetle on the back of a back of a penny. 
So our first case here in Knoxville was uh, in the Fountain City area of Knoxville. And this is the area of the, of the city where the person called the Division of Forestry. And because the university is right there, some of the university personnel went out with forestry, foresters and uh, found several trees in the Fountain City area that were declining. And they collected branches. And not only did they have the walnut twig beetle, but they were also infected with Gia Smithian Morbida. And it has continued somewhat. I will give you the rest of the story at the end. But uh, for several years, you could find walnuts like this down in Alcoa, Maryville, where Maryville College is on their campus. There were trees that were uh, infested with the beetle and infected with the fungus. Now, Dr. Haji Bark. Uh, has done some survey work uh, in the east and also gone to Oregon and California to collect. And uh, a lot of the trees look the same way, branch dieback, kind of a decline. Um, the trees in the west do seem to um, have a more rapid decline than the trees in the east. So the, it's been really interesting. There's been lots of theories on distribution of dials and canker disease and with some of the molecular work that's been done. Zerillo, I think in 2015, uh, there were two possibilities that it actually came from the southwest, spread northward and then to the east, or it actually another theory is that it may have originated in Southern California and then spread east. When we collect samples, we'll take a draw knife is really is a really inst handy instrument to have for both of these diseases, Laurel Wilt and Thousand Canker Disease. And you have to remove the bark very carefully because the cankers are usually just underneath. The cankers, once the beetle goes in and uh, pours its way into the twig under the bark and lays its eggs, the if it has geosmithy on it, that often the cankers will extend far beyond where the initial damage by the beetle. And fungal cankers can also coalesce and form large necrotic areas in the sapwood. The geosmithia morbida was the first member of the genus uh, to be considered a plant pathogen since then. At least one other species, I think, uh, geosmithia. Halida has been found causing a foamy canker disease of coastal live oak in the west. Um, it's a dry spore fungus associated with bark beetles and it, it forms numerous can, uh, cankers, hence the name thousand canker disease. Generally, if you're in an area where it's active, <clears throat> as we were in Knoxville when we first found it in 2010 in the Fountain City area, it was not a problem to find branches like this that were hit by numerous beetles and you can see the exit holes and then the galleries underneath and then geosmithia grew was grew in those galleries and um, one thing that uh, uh, Janita has mentioned is that the galleries in the western states were seem to be a little more shallow under the bark than the ones in Tennessee that seemed to be a little a little deeper. And Dr. Paris Lambden, who's retiring from our department this month, is an entomologist. He had a student, Catherine Nix, who did a study on the walnut twig beetle and uh, took these images showing the, the kind of the life cycle. It takes about five weeks to go from egg uh, to a general adult. Bill Klingman has had several students that have worked on the trapping of the walnut twig beetle over several years, and I'll share a little bit of information about that. And when they first started trapping, they didn't have a great idea of, of, of how to attract the walnut twig beetle. And as lures became available, it became a little bit easier, but they went out with lingram traps, hung them all at one level, and they had a string of traps from northeast Knoxville near Mascot all the way down to south of Maryville where Maryville College is over from 2011 to 2015. 
by running these traps, what they found was there were basically three peaks of seasonal flight activity with the male and female beetles. There was a mid-April to May flight, uh, late uh, mid-June to mid-July flight, and then there was also a third flight in the fall, male and females. One thing that Bill was wondering about was that in other bark beetles, they have different preferences or flight heights where you'll actually find them or they're easier to trap. So the next thing that his students found, decided to do was, well, what is the optimum trap height if you're gonna trap walnut twig beetles? So they had them in top of the canopy, mid canopy, and down at trunk level. And what they actually found out was, <clears throat> walnut twig beetle flies at all levels within walnut canopy. It really didn't matter at what height they had the traps. Next question they asked, is it a damaged tree possibly that they're attracted to or one that's stressed? So they actually girdled branches and hung traps close to those girdled branches or in trees that were not uh, injured. And as you girdle the branch over time, what happens is uh, you'll get yellowing and wilting just as you would as if, if uh, the branch was attacked by a walnut twig beetle. So what they found in this study was, yes, by mid-August, uh, a girdle limb became much more attractive to walnut twig beetle. Much more uh, beetles were attracted. So he, he had, his group had used the funnel-shaped traps, the lingering traps, and they also looked at uh, some of the two-liter bottle traps. And uh, one thing that they found was that ethanol actually uh, repelled. Ethanol by itself repelled the beetle, so it was not a help. You know, some ethanol is used to attract some of the ambrosia beetles, like the granulate ambrosia beetle here, but it didn't work for the walnut trig beetle. But so what did work? Well, what they found was uh, if they used ethanol to extract some of the volatiles from walnut wood, that was somewhat attractive. And there was uh, some synergy here. So let's look at the bottom of this chart. Unbaited, hardly any twig beetles trapped. Where well, they used a pheromone trap, great increase. Ethanol treated branch, not didn't work very well, but look what happened when they combined the pheromone trap with the ethanol treated branch. Large increase in the number of beetles that were attracted. And there were volatile organic compounds that were extracted uh, from walnut trees that they found to be very attractive to walnut twig beetle, caffeine, cymene, and a blend of those two. So another question that was asked, do the walnut, does the walnut twig beetle, does it smell the fungus in the field? <clears throat> so they set up a, they set up a test where they had a blank walnut, just a section of a walnut branch done to it, a, a walnut branch that had walnut twig beetles, uh, a branch that had auger and allure, and then branches that were in blanks that were infected with uh, geosmithia. And what they found was that the geosmithia infected blanks, those sections of walnut branch that they had infected with the fungus were fairly attractive to the beetle. The other thing they found was when they started looking at what fungi could they find on walnut twig beetles is that they were actually recovering lots of different fungi on these beetles, not just geospithia. Um, anything from alternaria to cladosporium to trichoderma and, and more on that later, but just lots of fungi were found on these beetles, male and female. So a little bit on diagnostics. Um, when, early on when samples came into the lab, they were basically processed like this. Uh, sections of branches came in, uh, the bark was peeled off with a draw knife, they were examined under a dissecting scope, and cankers or lesions from the cankers were wood chips were placed in incubation moist chambers for five days. Once it was off, once you could see the fungus growing in the galleries of the walnut twig beetle, then they took loops and extracted some of that and streaked it out on one half strength PDA. The, the, they 
um, would work to get a, a culture from that. <clears throat> now we had a student, Karen Deep, uh, who was looking at uh, just culturing walnut twig beetles to see if he could confirm Chiosmithia morbida. And it was very labor intensive and not particularly successful. I think he had one beetle out of almost 1,700 beetles where he actually found Chiosmithia morbida. But he had better luck with uh, using uh, molecular diagnostics. This is the young lady here is Amel Oren, and she did a study with Janita. Uh, she was looking at uh, molecular diagnostics and basically drilling in close to where the exit holes are, extracting wood and extracting DNA from that. <clears throat> and what she found was that she could, these were some studies from samples from California, Missouri, and Tennessee. And by, with the molecular diagnostics, she could find DNA of Geosmithia morbida or the walnut twig beetle, Pityophrys, in several trees that were extreme. So purple is, so see, gray is Geosmithia only. Purple is Geosmithia and the walnut twig beetle. Blue is no detection. And yellow is the walnut twig beetle only. So see, they were actually much more um, effective at identifying the fungus when they use the molecular diagnostics. Now let's go back to the young man who was trying to culture uh, Geosmithia from beetles and he was not that successful. When he switched to molecular diagnostics, he was very successful, not only with the walnut twig beetle, but he found several different uh, ambrosia or bark beetles that carried Geosmithia on them. And he's not the only one to find this. There have been other studies where people have noted this. So there are lots of beetles and even walnut, the born to walnut that can pick up geosmithia and even some weevils. So where are we at now in Tennessee? There is ongoing research. Janita's had a student that just finished up that looked at the microbiome of walnut and actually specifically the colosphere of the stem, looking at the bacteria community and fungal community and also soil around trees that were infected or not infected with thousand canker disease. Um, one thing that they found in the studies where they were looking at the fungi recovered from the galleries of the walnut twig beetle is that there were a ton of different fungi, including some trichoderma species of interest that showed some antagonistic act, uh, activity against Geosmithia morbida. Uh, other things they were looking on is trying to come up with a cheaper, quicker molecular test for um, TCD detection. So this is Aaron, one of uh, Janita's students uh, infecting the tree and they've, they're looking at the biological control project with trichoderma and also chemical control of thousand canker disease with phosphojet, which is a phosphoric acid fungicide. I mentioned the trichoderma species. They're still looking at this, looking at um, the antagonistic uh, activity it has against Geosmithia. They've got, I think, six isolates that, that the, she's had a student to work with. So that is ongoing. So let's go back to, there I am walking around looking at thousand canker disease in 2010. And uh, this tree was not tree zero, but it was pretty close. If we go to 2014, there's the same tree. So what happened? When we first found this in Tennessee, it was thought that any tree that was infected with thousand canker disease was history that it was going to die because out west it had been, I think, that it kind of been the experience that trees would decline and then die. But Following 2010, we had several years of pretty wet summers that were really good for growth. And a lot of these trees recovered, including the tree, not tree zero, but almost. This shows a tree in Blount County in 2010 and 2013 that was not only infected with Geosmithia, but infested with the walnut twig beetle. And it yet recovered also. So 
The story here in the Tennessee is that a thousand canker disease has definitely killed trees. Uh, it has injured trees, but there have been trees that have recovered and the spread has been really slow from the initial county fine, which was Knox County in 2010. On this part of my presentation, there's a ton of people that Dr. Klingeman and Dr. Hajibak have, have worked with on a lot of different studies and a lot of students have worked with thousand canker disease and I'd like to thank them for all their work. <clears throat> So let's go on to Laurel Wilt. And our, my story here is, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's not a one that we've, we've had going on for a long time. This is Laurel Wilt. We first found it in 2019 in Tennessee. So we're one of the inland states, so it hasn't been here a long time. Laurel Wilt was first found in Savannah, Georgia in 2002 and first found in Tennessee summer of 2019. It's caused by the fungus Raphaelia lauricula, which is vectored by the exotic red bay ambrosia beetle. And both the beetle and the fungus have been confirmed in Tennessee. I think the first, and this goes back to training first detectors, the first case of Laurel Wilt in Tennessee was found uh, by an arborist with Bartlett Tree. Uh, he had a client, uh, Fort Campbell Army Base, and he went to go look at some other tree problem and his contact there at the Army Base said, oh, by the way, why are all the sassafras trees dying on the base? So they went and looked, took samples, and uh, Bartlett Tree confirmed uh, that it was Laurel Wilt. And then this photo was from another, that was Montgomery County, Tennessee. Uh, another county that it was found in was uh, Dixon County, just south of Montgomery County. And this is an image of red bay ambrosia beetle that uh, Dr. Bud Mayfield used the Forest Service found last summer when visiting. So Laurel Wilt, uh, in Tennessee, the host range is basically two plants. Uh, it's sassafras and then lindera or spice bush that are in Laurel. Uh, AC family. Of course, our landscapers were concerned when we started talking about laurel wilt that was going to attack widely used cherry laurels here, skip and auto luke, and also our native mountain laurels, but those plants aren't in the laurel AC family, so they're not affected. And then in the coastal and deep south, laurel wilt has killed millions of red bay trees and has been really damaging to avocado groves in Florida. Of course, the sassafras and spice bush are hosts for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly, so there's also concern about losing those plants. We hope that we don't. <clears throat> You're probably familiar with all the damage that's been done to uh, the Red Bay around coastal areas. It's been unbelievably extensive and millions of trees have been killed. And you probably, you may have heard about laurel wilt and, and avocado groves causing extensive damage too, and it's both true. The, the latest map that I have on the distribution of Laurel Wilt in the southeast shows basically a coastal problem with some movement inland on sassafras. And if you look in Tennessee, we've got six counties that are that have uh, Laurel Wilt right on the Tennessee on the Tennessee Kentucky border, and three counties. Once defined in Montgomery County, the uh, folks in Kentucky started scouting and found it in three counties. There may be a newer map. I don't have, I think probably because of the pandemic, the scouting for this has probably slowed some. One interesting thing in Tennessee is not only the five counties cl cluster just northwest and west and southwest of Nashville, but also one outlying county, uh, Hamblin County over in East Tennessee. Uh, again, this was a individual that called their local forester and asked about uh, sassafras dying and the forester collected a sample and Janita uh, confirmed it in her lab. So our story here is um, some extension agents in those five counties started getting calls about sassafras. Uh, last August I went out with Mark Garrison and agent in Dixon County, Tennessee. We visited three farms. This is these are trees from one of the farms uh, I had never seen Laurel Wilt 
uh, other than uh, read about it and images and things. And we went and visited the first farm. And to be honest, I thought we would spend most of the day and find maybe one tree. What we found were hundreds of dead trees, sassafras like this. And on this particular farm, after looking at hundreds of trees, we did not find one live sassafras. And if we took a draw knife, removed the bark, and it had the, the characteristic uh, kind of chocolate brown streaking of the sapwood. Uh, I will say this, it, and this might be different uh, from the experience of someone in the coastal region with avocado and red bay, but there were not a lot of uh, exit holes that we could find from uh, the red bay ambrosia beetle and from talking to some of the other arborists in this area that doesn't appear to be uncommon. So it was easy to find symptoms of the disease, but not easy to find the beetle. Uh, here, and this is kind of preliminary, but early on it appears that once the, the fungus enters this current of your sapwood, the tree may die within three to four weeks. So it's really rapid. And the discoloration, we visited three farms, the discoloration was consistent throughout. And sapwood that we sent to Janita's lab in Knoxville, she was able to confirm that this was Laurel Wild. So these are images from the three farms that we visited in August of last year. And it was pretty much the same story every place. The third farm that we visited, I found a grove of fairly young sassafras. It's a, uh, that there were some trees that were still alive, but there was lots of damage from laurel wilt. Two of the three farms, we couldn't find a live sassafras, so the damage was extensive. From talking to the, to the landowners, they said that they thought the dieback had been going on for several years, and that, that may be true. Like I said, a draw knife is very handy to have when looking for laurel wilt and sassafras. Uh, you can easily take a little bit of bark off at a time and look for the discoloration in the sapwood. The other thing that I mentioned was we found a few exit holes. We don't know that it was necessarily from the red bay ambrosia beetle, but there definitely was the seemed to be an association of discolored sapwood with those exit holes. And some that we in some we found uh, frass characteristic of ambrosia beetles, but we did not find many exit holes or many beetles by any means. So there's some things that are being tried to slow the spread of laurel wilt, say in sassafras, um, not to move in uh, infected logs. Uh, in, in this area, it's not used widely as lumber, but there is some sassafras lumber that is milled, so you wouldn't want to spread that outside of an area. You wouldn't want firewood to go outside of an area of a positive county. It's not currently quarantined, and I don't think in Tennessee that it is going to be quarantined. Um, there is at least one case, the Williamson County, which is Franklin, Tennessee, just south of Nashville, sassafras infected with Laurel Wilt was actually in a, in a residential landscape. Uh, in that case, I think you could maybe try to protect trees as you would from the granulate ambrosia beetle. And so that's basically what I've got, Rachel. If there's any questions. All right, thanks so much, Alan. Let's see, we have a couple of questions. I'm gonna start off, let's see where I wrote my question down. I'm curious um, if we, Go back to thousand, your talk on thousand cankers disease. Um, I'm assuming, but I just want to be sure. You know what they say about assumptions. The trees were not. Um, there was no. Was there any treatment done to those trees that have recovered? No, no, there wasn't. And I think you know one of the things since uh, walnuts are considered a nut tree, you're really limited on what pesticides you can use on them. Um, but no, those trees were not treated. They were not treated in any way and they did recover. Yeah, and I'm curious, are, are, is there any evidence of beetles but the trees are just doing well and the, and the beetles are there but not really damaging it or does it look like there's real or is it hard to tell? 
Okay, one important thing that I forgot to mention about the uh, thousand canker disease and the walnut twig beetle in the Knoxville area is that the population has crashed. Uh, the population of walnut twig beetle, that is. So why does it happen? Well, Paris Lambden, Dr. Lambden, who's retiring that I mentioned, uh, he found, you know, there, there are lots of things that are going on. There may be some bowel control going on, like Bavaria. He found up to 14 predator beetles in trees that were infested with walnut twig beetle. And a couple of these predator beetles, when exposed to several different beetles, including walnut twig beetle, these predator beetles had a preference to eat walnut twig beetles. So there may be some biological control going on, but it definitely has slowed down or almost stopped the entomological research on thousand canker disease in the past, say, two or three years in the Knoxville area because the walnut twig beetle population has just crashed. Mm. Okay. So one question on the question and answer there was, is there any northern or southern limit expected for the distribution for laurel wilt or the red bay ambrosia beetle? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, earlier maps projected that laurel wilt would not get to Tennessee until 2030. So obviously probably was moved somehow and, it, and uh, you know, who knows exactly how it moved, but it certainly got here earlier than expected. But I think it probably, I'm not sure what the distribution of sassafras is, but I got a feeling they could probably, the red band, red, red band ambrosia beetle could probably survive in most of that range. Uh, there's a question about, is there any indication that the beetles both feed on these fungi like ambrosia beetles? Um, that's a good question. I don't know with Raphaelia that they, that it's that important or that they do, not like the walnut twig beetle does with geosmithia, um, but that's a good question. I'm not sure. Another question is what percentage of infected walnut trees recovered from thousand canker disease? Um, there were never that many trees. There were trees that were scattered across the 10 counties, but I would say probably 50% of the trees that were showing symptoms recovered. So a pretty high number. And a lot of that recovery we think was because of the wet summers that we had in 2011, 12, and 13 where growing conditions were just really good and the trees weren't stressed. That's all the questions I see on the question and answer. So um, Sharon Coleman had asked about, and I'm not sure if you know this because you're not, you know, you're in Tennessee, but she, with the map that you put up uh, um, showing where thousand cankers disease has been widely distributed in the West, she asks where it's been reported in Washington state. So I can mention this, that we have um, a link on our first detector training site on the thousand cankers disease page that allows you to see where it's been reported and through ed maps. So that does show up some um, Washington counties there. Sharon, if you'd like to check that out. Um, I don't know if that is the full picture. I think there's probably more uh, reports in the West. Um, so on that on the thousandcankers.com website, you can go and choose your state also. Oh, great. They may have distribution on that too. Okay, I will check that and maybe I can add that to the first detector page as well. So Alan, while um, I'll give people a little more time to put in their questions, um, what is your recommendation or suggestion to people, you know, sort of very different things um, happening with each of these diseases um, in the eastern half of the country? Um, what advice do you have for people in terms of monitoring, you know, their, you know, sassafras or um, spice bush or walnuts? Um, should they be looking for these? Should they report? Um, are, are people not as worried about uh, thousand, thousand cankers disease in the east? Well, let's start with uh, like sassafras and, and spice bush first. There's a lot of concern 
for both trees. Even, you know, their sassafras, I think it's called the most fragrant tree in Tennessee. And of course, the spice bush is a valued native ornamental and also important for the butterfly. But yeah, we, we'd like, for, we are talking about this. We're trying to educate people through social media and get people to look. And if they see something that looks like uh, Laura Wilt, contact uh, their extension agent or their local forester. For, same thing for thousand canker disease. They've been, uh, Tennessee Department of Ag has a nice web page on it. We still talk about it on social media and we do ask people to um, to look for it because we want to map the distribution, know exactly where it's at. Let's see, a couple more questions on the question and answer. Does the presence of Laurel Wilt mostly in the South mean that it's, there's a temperature barrier to its spread? I don't know, I think, you know, with thousand canker disease, with the uh, genetic studies that they've done with the fungus, uh, Janita and her students feel like there's been at least uh, multiple introductions to the east, probably through lumber or logs that were brought from infested areas. They, back when we found the, the year, you know, the year uh, that we found thousand canker disease in Knoxville, uh, even as we were talking about it and uh, letting people know about it, you could go on Craigslist and there were people selling walnut logs and timber uh, boards to woodworkers and we were concerned that it was going to be spread outside of the area and uh, there was a quarantine that was initiated against thousand canker disease in Tennessee not to move wood outside the area and that several states have that. Uh, I don't really think the temperature barrier, I think that pretty much the spread initially around the coast was due to the probably the movement of the beetle. Uh, but I think the spread of it into Tennessee, it's a great jump of a couple hundred, two or three hundred miles from where it was existed. There had to be uh, beetles moved somehow probably. But I don't know exactly what the temperature barrier would be. Uh, another question, do the recovery seen on walnuts in the wet good growing season, would this be a treatment homeowners could apply? culture happiness. Well, it seemed to work here. So uh, like a lot of woody plants that get canker diseases, I basically tell gardeners here, you know, if you love it, water it, uh, because we have, we'll have a drought. Like we had a flash drought in the fall of 2019, just last year. It, it caused a lot of damage to uh, conifers here. And uh, so sometimes irrigation is a great treatment to prevent stress and maybe make the tree uh, help it recover, make it less attractive to more hits from the beetles. I think that that's a great, you know, that holds true for anything, right? A lot of different borers and diseases attack trees when they're stressed. So in extreme cases, you know, giving a tree some extra, you know, TLC is could never hurt. I, I don't know how practical it is on a, on a large scale, but as you mentioned, if it's something you really care about, I think it can only help. I think so, yeah. It's, it seems to work that way for, you know, canker diseases like ceridium canker and botrysphere canker and ornamentals. Those trees that are watered during a drought or shrubs, we don't see that much damage and those that were really stressed by drought, we, we'll see a lot more damage. Right. Well, last chance to get a question in for Dr. Windham before we wrap up. Thank you, Alan, so much for your time today. It's yeah, thanks for everybody for attending and uh, Rachel, thank you so much. Yeah, we are, you know, we're recording this and the link will be posted. It'll be on our YouTube channel, but I'll also link to it um, on the same page where people registered for this program. Uh, we have one more webinar uh, scheduled for next week in our summer series. And the last one will be on Phytophthora remorum, which uh, is the pathogen that causes um, sudden oak death and remorum blight. And that presentation will be delivered by Rachel Baumberger, uh, Marianne Elliott, and Jenny Glass, all from the University of Washington. 
um, extension folk and plant pathologists out there. So yeah, join us if you've been following all along, I'm sure to be another uh, great presentation. So anything else? It doesn't look like anything else has come in. So Alan, thanks again. Thank you everybody for participating. And any, thank, anything thank else? Thank you, Rachel. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Take care.